And that, that's the bit we don't do. What we do is, is, giving, is building the capacity, the confidence, the empowerment of women to be engaged in processes so that you, you have to find ways in which the, you t give them the confidence of what they say, what they do, how they do it. It is worth something, so I, I, I think the education we would do would be more on that side and, and, and getting them realising that actually the, the knowledge they have of their farm or their business is worth, and we can bring something to them that, that trains them maybe on how to, to farm slightly differently or how to work their, bu their business side, but that they bring something positive. So more of what we do is on, a, a, as Christian Aid specifically, um, is, is that level of, of bringing... Well, well, beyond Christian Aid then, um, the, the education of girls in particular, uh, which, you know, in girls in, in the developing world often just don't have the education, they get very few years of yeah. it. Do you, do you feel that is an important oh, no. part? Oh, no, without a doubt. You're just, yeah, because I, I think Aid from any level yes, of, yes, yes. of impact, you know, the, 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 <clears> there's a huge... Um, but if women are educated, they have... They marry later, they have more choice over their body, they have more, more options in, the, in life in the, in the future and that they, have, they can make better choices all round uh, and that then when they do come to the workplace they, they feel more confident, they can, they know, their, you know, you know the how, to, how to manage money, they know how to <laughs> um, deal with, with that situation. So I think there's a lot of multiple effects other than just the basics of reading and writing and numbers is that, um, that they can engage the community and that they... they there is evidence that educated women have much more say over say, things like marriage, fertility, and um, other aspects. Okay. Thank you. Um, just picking up on, the, on a few points that various people have made. Com communication, and, uh, it's it, absolutely critical, obviously, because I'm talking to you, we're looking at each other face to face. Um, in Christianity, through a glass darkly and then face to face. Mm -hmm. I would argue that we are living in times where we are in the middle of, of a dark glass. Those are the times we're living in. But when we communicate really well, then the interface mm -hmm. between us as human beings becomes special, mm -hmm. becomes truly meaningful, becomes beautiful, becomes loving. And that's where the woman, who hasn't had her given her co correct role historically for, for far too long, you could argue, is the interface, the human interface, that communication, where the woman is becoming absolutely critical, yeah. and the, the person who has been downtrodden for all sorts of reasons which are not valid, really, on a moral level, that that, that person is, is becoming more equal. So there's an equalisation process going on socially across the world. I think there's um, always been a better balance of masculine and feminine mm -hmm. are both coming into play. It's like in, in nature, it's like that in all things. And you look mm -hmm. at somewhere like the House of Commons that is so imbalanced and you actually have to be a bit more man-shaped to even get in the door, mm -hmm. is that if that was more balanced, I don't think there would be the baying across and there would have been a, a different way and a different behaviour, but we weren't there to influence the creation of that place Whereas I think now we would have a totally different system. I did, just thought I'd chip in there because I read, I read some research about um, the Scottish Parliament mm -hmm. and how um, the the sort of um, in Westminster it's all about that interrupting and breaking the yes. rules and stuff. And and the men like use that more to their advantage than women do and shout over women. And actually, the, there's actually I can't remember the details. I read it a while ago, but it just came to mind that there's a much more civilized deep discourse in the Scottish Parliament because it was set up with a higher portion of women from, from the beginning. And the way they laid it out too, I think I read the same thing, yeah. that they laid it out so you didn't have benches staring at each other and, and making that ghastly bullying that they do to each other. Yeah, you're right. And, and if you watch any of the Scottish Minister stuff, it's, it's quite amazing that it's civilised. So. Yeah. Same thing with the European Parliament. They're saying that it's actually it's, it is in a circle. Mm -hmm. First of actually, pe pe the public can actually see them. Yeah. Well, and the actually House of Commons were, you know, yeah. It's like a narrow, get, like exactly, a position. Yeah. And, each other. and there's not enough room for them. They're made <laughs> to sit in discomfort. Why do we suffer? Like, make it a nice office, put them in a board. Yeah, well, move them to Leeds. Yes, Birmingham or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to chip in? Yeah. Come on, International Women's Day. <laughs> But I think the work that you've been doing on the anti fracking is absolutely fantastic oh, and it's an inspiration. Yeah. You know, you can't, you wouldn't imagine. I've seen you speak a couple.
couple of times now, um, back in Blackpool last year and things, and you wouldn't imagine that prior to this you were an activist because it comes so naturally. And I think what, what we need to do more within our movement, um, and this is something I discussed at a conference a couple of weeks ago, is, is making people of all levels of the movement, inside and out, yeah. recognise their validity. Yeah. Because yeah. If, yeah. even if all you can do to be active is provide somebody else with some material, yeah. that's you supporting yeah. that campaign, mm -hmm. and that's you actively saying, I'm against, I'm mm -hmm. standing with you, and I'm against what you're against. I think we need to champion that more yeah. because I mean I came here today and I said to a couple of people, you know, I sat on the on the plenary session this morning next to a professor and an MP and I'm thinking, I'm not an expert in this field, do you know? Oh, and it's quite a daunting but it's quite a daunting thing, but yeah, actually very. I am an expert in comparison yeah. to other people yeah. and I've got things that people can <coughs> learn from me and, and it's all about sharing those experiences, sharing that knowledge because doing that would become stronger, don't we? But do you not kind of get the thing, and I think the thing I get which is there was a point where I was so scared to speak out loud before I ever did uh, and then you realise that that was in itself a vanity really, which is that I'm being concerned about how you perceive me, whereas really I don't actually care how you perceive me. I am an envelope, I have a really important message, and if I don't get it out, their children will die. So that's what I do, so you do that. So Elle's here today because Elle's been speaking out more and more at the roadside, and we've discovered that Elle's a really good speaker, so we need more good speakers. But <laughs> we, were having, to elevate. we were having a conversation today though on the way here about how activism takes many, many different forms and you know, Tina's really good at speaking and there are people that bring us food to the roadside, there are people that we can go round to the house and have showers, there are people that come down and give us a hug, there are people that send you a message and say hi, how are you doing today, there are lots of different, you know, there are keyboard warriors, there are just, it takes so many so many different levels, I mean, right from the ground, like I've been involved in peaceful non the peaceful non-violent direct actions of sticking your arms in tubes and throwing yourself in front of lorries peacefully. To basically slow down the industry as much as possible and make it not viable to investors pull out, which is when local democracy fails, which is a last resort, you're not left with anything else. But obviously that leads to arrests and leads to court cases and not everybody is able to do that and not everybody should do that because you can't just have everybody taking that tactic. Mm. You know, everybody is equally valid in everything they do and it just it does and it takes that many people with that many different skills and that much knowledge to actually you know achieve your end goal, which you know is ours is to stop fracking or whatever it is you're doing. So yeah. It's important like to important. let people know that though as well. Yeah. yeah. You know. It's like as a single parent, I couldn't just get up and go, and I certainly yeah. could never tie myself to a doobie. Of course not. I mean, my husband, <laughs> never mind Millie's, you know, safely at home. So, you know, I think, I don't know, speaking for myself, it took a long time to actually feel that I was equal to another activist. So, you know, yeah. and I think I mean, a lot of people need to feel, you know, they need to be told. Yeah. Yeah. We, we as Christian is, and most of our supporters are church going which is normally over 60 or whatever and we've had uh, a number of groups we do we do small trainings or whatever but um go to the at the moment we're doing a campaign to the banks to get them to pull the funding out of fossil fuels mm. uh, and to change their policy you know actively change the policies and we've had people go to visit their bank managers yeah. take a big piggy bank and say you know sort of tell you know and just uh, give them enough to feel and that's it's um it's not you know, yeah. climbing a tower or sticking yeah. around. It, 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 it is, and actually sometimes people are more scared of normal folk saying it out yeah. loud. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's a complementarity. Yeah. And in terms of what you're saying in language, I remember when I was doing my engineering course, all the blokes had all the jargon, they had all the words. But I was doing as well or better than them in the exams and actually delivering, it. there's an awful lot of yeah. bravado and, 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 and that's the same, it's a class issue. Um, there's the, 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 a certain class that will talk over you. And, will, will, mm -hmm. and actually, I, more and more I've done this, they've realised that, I, as a valid point, I, from my perspective, I am an expert. <laughs> um, but I would compliment what, what you do with what a lot of I do and, and professionals in this sector do, which is making that economic case. There's no economic case for fracking in the UK. It, it, it would be much, much more expensive than, than importing for starters or for, for other sources. And it's much more expensive than finding other solutions. And, and we're likely to, to export it anyway. We're like, exactly, and not benefit, um, which is what they're doing when they're <coughs> taking gas out of the Amazon, which is what they're doing, you know, and exporting it to the USA. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that we really need to be investing in solutions, and yes. it's not fracking. Yes. We ought to really pick the winners. In the 70s, there was a choice between 
wave power and nuclear power, and all the money went into nuclear power. It didn't go, we are surrounded by waves. <laughs> and if it invested then, we would have an alternative. Yes. You yes. know, so there are choices that are being made at political. So I would say that there's a lot of complementary work being done. Um, there's different ways in which you engage. You can yeah. be activist, you can go talk to your MP, you can go to, you know, the, the, the right yeah. at retters and, and join campaigns. But uh, yeah. so, so we, we, we work a lot, uh, so even can we convince, trying to convince the Church of England to oppose fracking. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but we try and make different, through different audiences, you have yeah. to make the different places, but there's no economic viability of that no. whatsoever. Yeah. I wonder though, if women to... feel like, like how I did in the beginning as well, which I suppose is what I'm really conscious of, which is that, I'm not good enough to go in there. Yeah. I can't do it. And then if I'd have seen L, I'd have been like, oh, I can never <laughs> be L. But maybe I didn't need to be L. I just needed to be Tina and you needed to be Sarah. And we needed to find who we were and grow within that. And the best thing about activism, the best thing about it is it's autonomous and voluntary. Mm. No one can tell me Freedom. how far to go or how far not to go. No one can tell me how to put one foot in front of the other each day. I'll decide that. And I'll decide on the days that I want to take a more radical action or if I don't. And these are my choices and no one can tell me. So I find it quite the most empowering and educational thing I've done in 56 years of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, uh, just back on to one of the points just really, really quickly. I don't really like the word activist, I don't really like the word when somebody gets called a hero or a warrior or a protester even, you're just you and you're just doing your thing. It's like when I first got into activism, I was a local, I was just an, I'm just an ordinary working class girl, I was trained to be a nurse, um, I guess came to a town where I live in Ellesmere Port and I learned about fracking and that was three years ago, you know, so it was like I just went to camps, I cooked food, I did leaflet distribution, I just got involved like really, really, really gradually and slowly, so it's not like oh well, you know, you do a certain type of action and that makes you a better person everyone else, you know, than everybody else or what you do is less invalid because it's just, without one, there wouldn't be another and it just, yeah. it just none of it yeah. would work so everything is just so valid and important, you know because I, I live on a camp, like, outside and people say to me, well, I couldn't do that well, not everybody needs to do that, that's not for everybody, you know what I mean because it's like, you know, anarch building anarchist communities and different ways of life but you know, people sitting at home and doing their thing and people coming out onto the road and doing their thing. Like I say, it's all just equally important and everybody's just... That's what we need to get out there. Equally active. Is more, it's as yeah. important yeah. as everybody else's because it is that support, isn't it? And if, if that's all you can do, that's fine. That's fantastic. You're supporting us. Yeah. 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 And never say no to anything either. Like people, if they come with cake or cookies or <laughs> fabrics, you just say yes. Every beep yeah. of the horn is someone going, I'm an activist too. That's them with one foot in your cap, you know, and if all they did was bring you some cake, then that they're all, but they're supporting, they just sold into the right cap, you know, yeah. yeah I mean, I do actually remember because uh, when we first started in Occupy, I didn't really know anything about activism as such, pol politics. I thought I did, but I realized I actually knew more about uh, <clears throat> American politics because of the BBC. Nothing much about British politics. <laughs> and the pleasure being one of the, well, sanitation guys. Cleaning the um, cleaning the portal loose every morning. Yes. <laughs> so we did that for what three months. Oh, then after that, it became live stream. Yeah. But uh, in Balkum, like Barry Gardner was saying, yes, that um, were the Tories. But in Balkum, it was actually Tory heartland. Yeah. I remember somebody coming in with the uh, home cooked um, uh, scones, which yeah. is great. And then of course the uh, the uh, the ladies who actually did uh, the writing to their MPs. Yeah. And a lot of people did actually have uh, were concerned. They didn't actually come during the daytime. They came during the evening because they otherwise they would have gotten in trouble with the landlord, yeah. which was the major landowner in that area. So yeah. there was timidity, but then they were made welcome, and they mm. found their ways to support us with food and with everything. Yeah. Else. yeah. First time I went to a camp where actually this, everything was organic. Yes. <laughs> Can I just add something? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 No, no, of course. I just quickly wanted to say that there is going to be a summit on women in climate change um, at the British Library on the 1st and 2nd of June, um, if anyone's interested. Invisible Dust are running it. It's called Under Her Eye. Um, oh, nice. First in June. Okay. <laughs> Margaret Atwood will be there. She's our keynote speaker. Oh, okay. Um, and along with lots of really amazing questions about how women are leading the front on, on, on climate change. And lots of artists also talking about the work they're making about climate change. Sorry, where did you say it's going to be at? British at the Library. British Library. Oh, my cool. And the summit is ticketed and the tickets are on sale now, and the art summit is free, and you can just come along. Sorry to plug it. I'm not, not like plugging it in a way, but just like it's really amazing. <laughs> and it would be really great to have all of your voices there. Well, we say something confident. You know, be confident about plugging your yeah. event. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great event. Come. <laughs>
Yeah, I just wanted to add that about Balkan, because you've raised it, right? Um, what I noticed, which was profound for me, and everyone's going to think, yeah, big deal, but it was profound, and I think it may be an alleviation of poverty thing. It's like, you know, I didn't think I could stay, and then, you know, I got a childcare person to look after Millie, and I literally <coughs> fall out of the car at 6 a.m. in the morning. There was a ready-made community mm-hmm. of people getting ready for the next day, drinking tea, making stuff in the... You know, and it was like, wow. Yeah. You know, there was a I guy met- there who, um, you know, was talking about things, Dora the Explorer backpack, so one last standing joke. Yeah. And he had come from care, he didn't have a home or, a, or anything, but he was with the cab. And he came up to him, running up to him about week two of Balkan, which was a, one of the first anti-fracking cabs, and said, oh, quick, Tina, what's fracking? Oh, oh, you've been here two weeks now. Where, where, why are you here? Why? And he said, you have food, there's a free tent, it's a really nice community. I was like, okay. So I gave him a quick rundown of what fracking was. He went off, and about a week later, I saw one of the residents say to him, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all you do for our community. And I watched him blossom and grow with that. Do you know, the simple thank you. I think it... We're all made to feel worthless at some point in our life, in our community. And if, if activism is what it takes to make people feel included, then let's all just be activists, you know, and we'll fix the world as a side effect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking, I want to mention that, um, if you know this sort of successful community resistance, um, I thought I'd just mention the thing I've <coughs> recently, which is, is basically the attempt to, to bypass that level. So at the moment, there's a select committee inquiry um, which is saying that um, the decisions on fracking applications should be made by the Secretary of State, mm-hmm. bypassing local councils. There's also another consultation going on, which is saying, which is basically trying to strengthen the guidance of local authorities. So it now says, you know, I paraphrase, fracking is absolutely brilliant. You must facilitate it at all costs. Yes. So I they are trying that. to. The response to what's going on on the ground is to try and be more heavy-handed from the top. And I was trying to find. I can't find this brilliant quote from. Greenpeace, Hannah Martin, and it was—it basically says the government's pushed everything at fracking. Exactly. If, if you know, and all they've got to show for exactly. it is a couple of muddy holes in the ground. Yes. Imagine, <laughs> imagine what would have happened if they put the same effort behind renewable energy. Exactly. I mean, it's just, it's exactly. Just, exactly. <laughs> Actually, Nigel. So this is why you need the different all the levels. You need people going in at the government and any kind of pressure on MPs to stop them <laughs> trying yeah. to override all the communities. Oh. Actually, they were saying, um, it was actually John Sinner was pointed out that uh, because there's local communities actually don't like renewables like uh, wind farms and even solar, uh, solar energy, the fact that um, it's still a corporation going into a local community and imposing it on their side. But then if it actually became like what they tried to do in Balkan, which is a, a community energy scheme yeah. and it's going to be a cooperative, that would actually gain a lot more you know, uh, supporters. So there would be... if. If the local community ends up with the solar panels and the um, and the wind farms, and actually, yeah, there would there would be a lot more support. There's an example, a couple, few examples of Welsh farmers doing doing just that, setting up their own wind turbines, and it's keeping them on their land and their families on their land as an yeah. extra income. And the, you know, the, the, but it's the same in, as I said in Kenya. When it comes and it's landed and it takes mm-hmm. people off the land, it doesn't work. There's much better ways of doing it. I think that, that involve the community. Okay. I mean, we have in my sorry London, my local area of uh, Barnet, we had the same problem. Like the libraries were actually running out of money because of central government. One idea from a local blogger was actually uh, put solar panels on top of it. And that would actually generate, he, he did, yeah, that would actually generate income, goes back into the local community, and then would keep the, um, the libraries open. Of course, the, can I, can I just, unfortunately they didn't I'm do it. I'm interrupting you, Sorry. because Sorry. The, we're supposed to be starting the final theory in 10 minutes. Right. Ooh, okay. Okay, one minute rising, thank you. Mm-hmm. I did three glasses of water, so I'm going to 